Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of Digital Fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn. Today's deck is very special indeed. Now, this is my very first Explorer deck on the channel. And I was motivated to make this because of the recent release of Innistrad Remastered, Shadows Over Innistrad Remastered. Um, everyone's going wild for the new set that's in Arena. Everyone's trying to uh, explore different options for creating historic decks or explorer decks, seeing how explorer can get closer to being like the Pioneer format. And uh, everyone's having a good time with it. I thought it was a good time to revisit one of my favorite standard brews slash historic brews that I've done in the past and modernize it for Explorer. And this, this deck is called Forgotten Fiend. Now, this is all about utilizing synergies between Priest of Forgotten Gods and Fiend Artisan using a brand new card that came out with Phyrexia All Will Be One called Tyvar Jubilant Brawler. Now, this card's insane in this deck. I can't wait to see <laughs> how you guys feel about these games. The deck's kind of wild, but before we get to that, make sure you like this video. It's really, really hard to push through the algorithm and get more people to see my videos, so please like it so that you can help this video get out to more people. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'm going to be putting up videos every single day if I can. And tons more decks coming. I'm going to link the deck tech for the original deck that inspired this one up above. So check that one out if you haven't already. It's two years old, I think, at this point, but it's a hell of a trip. And without further ado, let's check it out. All right, so this deck actually used to be one of my favorite decks when it was standard legal. It has since rotated out, and now we brought it back into Explorer, and we've given it some upgrades from cards that weren't available back when it was standard legal, and we've turned it into one hell of a beast. So let's start with the core of the deck and sort of the combo that the whole deck synergizes around. And the idea is Priest of the Forgotten Gods. We get this down for two mana as a 1-2. We can tap it, sack two other creatures, and then any number of target players each lose two life and sacrifice a creature. You add two black mana and draw a card. So the idea here is, if the entire deck is giving us value off of our own creatures dying, we can just get this engine going, keep sacrificing things, keep making our opponent lose two life, lose additional life depending on what other permanents we have in play that can trigger that life loss, and then we're gaining more mana, drawing cards, and just keep drawing into things that we can keep the engine going until the, the opponent just dies. Um, in order to make sure we always have a Priest of Forgotten Gods, We've also got four copies of Fiend Artisan. Now, Fiend Artisan comes down for two hybrid mana. It's a 1-1. One, one. Gets plus one, plus one for each creature card in our graveyard, which means it's going to get really big as we start to sacrifice more and more creatures to the Priest uh, or to the Fiend Artisan itself because its other ability is we can pay one hybrid mana and X, tap it, sacrifice any other creature, search our library for a creature card with mana value X or less, put it onto the battlefield, and shuffle. So the main thing we want to use this Fiend Artisan for is to ensure we can get our Priest of Forgotten Gods into play consistently. Uh, if we don't have a Priest in our opening hand, we want to hope that we have a Fiend Artisan in our opening hand. And then we play one drop on one, Fiend Artisan on two, turn three, we can spend our three mana to sacrifice the one drop, search for a Priest, and start to get our combo going. At that point, if we have Priest and Fiend Artisan in play, our opponent has a very difficult decision to make about which one he kills. If he kills the Priest so he shuts down our Priest engine, uh, we can just use Fiend Artisan to find something else, to find another Priest and get the engine back online. But if he kills the Fiend Artisan, our engine is still viable, we just keep going next turn. So. It can be really hard to deal with unless you can somehow remove both in the same turn, and that tends to be d very difficult, especially when Fiend Artisan's getting bigger every time we sacrifice creatures, which means it starts to outgrow burn and can only really get removed by hard removal. Um, and it tends to be very difficult to deal with. Now, because we can ser uh, search for any creature when we sack something, um, there are going to be times when we don't need to grab the Priest, and we can find Silver Bullet, uh, silver bullet Tutor targets that are within the deck. Uh, so there's a lot of one-ofs in here, as long as it's not a card that we need a play set of, that we need to be consistent with, just to keep our options open, so that in any given situation, we can find the card that we need to, in order to get the deck moving with forward momentum again. Um, very, very cool card, and I love the way these two in particular interact with each other. Now... At the 1-drop slot, it's important that we have 14 1-drops. 
Mathematically speaking, we want to make sure we can play a one drop on turn one, a priest or fiend artisan on turn two, and then another one drop on turn three so that we could potentially sacrifice it that turn. If we sacrifice both of our one drops to a priest of forgotten gods on turn three and still have two mana left, that gives us four mana after the priest activation. And that's enough to just completely overwhelm the board with, with presence and a lot of times overwhelm our opponent with value and it's hard to come back from. So I think 14 one drops is where we need to be. So we've got four Llanowar Elves for Gilded Goose. Now this gets us our mana ramp so that we can get stuff into play earlier, get extra creatures out quicker, keep the engine going or starting earlier, um, and, and just keep the deck running consistently. A lot of times we only need to tap a creature once for mana, and then it ends up getting sacrificed anyway. So something like Gilded Goose that can give us a mana of any color but only once tends to go up in value in a deck like this because we're just going to end up sacrificing it and then if we do end up getting it back from the graveyard later we actually get a food out of out of the deal um and sometimes we need that food to gain some life but a lot of times we're just going to hold on to it for more mana but i think gilded goose is is perfect here as our one drop mana dork and then of course the elves to go along with it and then we've got four serrated scorpion because if we can just keep searching for scorpions with fiend artisan dumping them in the yard with priest of forgotten gods we can close out the game a lot quicker by sacrificing this to priest or or just sacrificing it to fiend artisan to find something sometimes we're even going to just sacrifice a scorpion to fiend artisan to search out another scorpion um what we really want to do is set ourselves up so that we have a board state where they can't sweep the board without dying and we'll get to that in just a bit uh our last two one drops are one ofs that we can search out we have a shambling ghast because in the right situations we could theoretically search out a ghast, sacrifice it to a priest, uh, kill something with one toughness, like maybe an opposing Llanowar Elves, before the priest trigger uh, resolves, so that they, they can't sacrifice that smaller creature to the priest's ability. Um, and then we can kill two creatures at the same time, more importantly, force them to sacrifice a bigger creature by getting rid of the thing with one toughness, which is nice. It's also nice to put it out early, because once we sack it to the priest to get the engine going, it'll create a treasure, and it's another way to ramp, although it doesn't make that mana before being sacrificed, before getting the engine online, so we have to be a little bit more careful about it, and that's why there's only one here. And then we've also got one cult, cult Conscript, because, I mean, if we get this down on one, sometimes it can get in for two damage on turn two uh, before we start the engine, but what's most important about Cult Conscript is if we're running out of gas in our hand, as long as we're sacrificing something, this is the only skeleton in the deck, so as long as we're sacrificing something on our turn and something's dying, we can just keep bringing back the Cult Conscript every single turn, and it effectively makes it so that Priest only needs one creature to sacrifice instead of two, um, because we could just keep bringing back the conscript and sacking it to the priest and keep the engine going. It gets it gets pretty wild. So having just one of those that we can search out with Fiend Artisan if we're running out of gas and we just need this recursive way to keep triggering priest, or even to just keep triggering Fiend Artisan to find more stuff as the turn goes on, we have this that we can search out. Moving on into the two drop slot, we've already talked about the four Priest of Forgotten Gods and the four Fiend Artisan, which are crucial to the engine. We've got one Lazatep Reaver because, again, we can search this out if we're in a position where, say we've got a Priest and a, a Fiend Artisan down, and we don't want to sacrifice the Fiend Artisan to the Priest, um, and we have like one other one drop or something in play. What we can do is sack the one drop to the Fiend Artisan to search up the Lazatep Reaver, which when it enters the battlefield, it will amass one. We'll get two bodies off this one card so that we can sacrifice those two bodies to the Priest and we can keep our Fiend Artisan on the board, which is then going to be even bigger because of the Lazatep Reaver being in the yard. So in a certain situation where we really have creatures on the board we don't want to sacrifice, Lazatep Reaver can keep the engine going while we can keep our important creatures in play. And then we've also got one Zulaport Cutthroat, because if we just need to go over the top, this is, a, this is another way we can get a creature into play here that protects our board state. They can't wipe the board unless they exile everything, because we have so many things in play that trigger that when our board dies, they just lose a ton of life. So we set up a position where 
Our board state's untouchable without exile removal. They can't sweep because the amount of damage they take is just overwhelming and they'll, they'll immediately die. And there's a few more cards coming up we'll talk about that play into that. And then we've also got one Dina Soul Steeper. Now, this is cool to search up in certain situations with Fiend Artisan because a lot of the things we have in the deck that are causing our opponent to lose life uh, when one of our creatures dies are also going to make us gain life. And so Dina here will make them basically take double damage in a way. Not necessarily like in the case with Serrated Scorpion where they we drain for two. We're only going to hit them for one extra damage with Dina because each instance of, of life loss is what's going to trigger losing one life. Or, or rather, each instance of life gain is going to be what, what causes Dina here to make them lose one life. So it's not going to be one life per one life we gain. Uh, it's per instance. But everything else other than the Scorpion... Um, gains us one life at a time anyway in the deck. So in a way, it's, other than the Scorpion, it's it's like doubling how much damage the opponent takes as our things die. Uh, and speaking of doing damage as things die, we have two Meat Hook Massacre. Now, this card is great. It's actually mainly in here just for the extra uh, text on, on the card. Two black mana in X, Legendary Enchantment. Whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses a life. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, you gain a life. So with this in play, we do an additional damage to our opponent for every creature on our side that dies. And if we happen to have this and Dina in play, whenever their creatures die, we're gaining life, and then Dina's doing even more damage to our opponent. It's also nice to have a backup way here to sweep the board if things get out of control. We can Meat Hook Massacre as a board sweeper, clear the board, and kind of start over from, from zero. Um, so it's nice to have that extra versatility and extra reach in the same card that we kind of want to be using anyway for the aristocrats sort of sacrifice synergies that it has. Moving on to three drops, we've got a very core piece of the deck. This is Bastion of Remembrance. This is three mana um, for an enchantment, and it makes it so that whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses a life and you gain a life. Another thing that can trigger uh, Dina as well. When it comes into play, you also get a 1-1 white human soldier creature token, which is not nothing. Being able to get this ability on the field uh, in the form of an enchantment, which is a lot harder to get rid of than creatures, while also creating a body that could potentially chump block and do more damage to the opponent when it does die from chump blocking, can sometimes be super important. Also in the 3-drop slot, we have 3 Call of the Death Dwellers. Uh, I'd like to fit 4 but I think three is the right number here. And this just makes it so that if they're killing our, our priest early or our fiend artisan early, um, if we're sacrificing our one drops, this is a really good way of getting back our priest or our fiend artisan and a one drop, getting extra value. Sometimes we can get back a scorpion and give it death touch, which is awesome. We can get back a fiend artisan and give it menace. Like, there's a lot of versatility in what this card can do for the deck. It helps protect us against removal that the opponent has. We can get our engine back online after they remove our, our core pieces. But then it also gives us extra reach and extra ways to put more creatures on the field to keep the engine going a little bit later in the game. So, very, very good card for this deck. We've got one Midnight Reaper, because he makes it so that every time one of our creatures dies, we get to draw a card. We have to lose a life, but... It's fine because we have plenty of ways of gaining life in this deck. Um, so, like I said, in important uh, situations where we really need to draw cards, we can search this up with Fiend Artisan, especially against Control. Again, going back to talking about them sweeping our board, sometimes we get to a point where they can't sweep our board without dying because of all of the sacrifice triggers, but sometimes we're not quite there, and if we can just get a Midnight Reaper onto the field then that can give us enough card advantage if they sweep the board that we refill our hand and then we can just vomit it all out the next turn and kill them anyway. So against control, this Midnight Reaper is very, very important to search up. We've also got one Woe Strider. Now this is in here for a couple reasons. First of all, it gives us two bodies for one card, which is nice. Secondly, it gives us a sack outlet for no mana. So at any time, if we have... Bastion down, maybe two Bastions, we have a Meat Hook, we have some other things that are going to trigger this life loss um, as our things die. If we get a Woe Strider into play, we can trigger it ourselves. If they try to exile something, we can just sacrifice it to Woe Strider so that we get the pings in and we get to Scry, which is really nice. Um, also, it's just more value where if we're running out of gas, 
we can escape it from the graveyard, put it back into play, and have a little bit more lasting power when otherwise we would be stuck in the mud. So Woe Strider as a one of that we can search up with the Fiend Artisan is really important. And then last up, we have Ayara, first of Lockthwain. 2-3 uh, here. It makes it so that every creature that enters the battlefield, every black creature, but every, every creature in this deck is black with the exception of the token that comes from Bastion of Remembrance. But every creature that enters the battlefield is going to make us gain a life and our opponent lose a life. So again, it's going to be another way to add those triggers, and it's going to be on things coming into play rather than dying. So we can get some extra reach, some extra value out of all of our creatures by having IR in play. And then it also lets us sacrifice our black creatures to draw cards, which is nice. A lot of times if they try to use their removal on our priest or our fiend artisan and we have an IR in play, we can at least sacrifice it in response, draw a card, and help to refill our hand enough to just make it so our next turn really matters and we can kind of come back against the losing board state. So a lot of times that extra value that she can provide is important and the extra reach with the damage is also important. And again, we, we're gaining life as well from her. So that's another thing that can trigger Dino, which is really nice. Um, we want to talk about the mana base for a moment. Uh, it's important that every land in the deck that makes green can come down on turn one and make green on turn one, but then also make black on turn two. And that's because a lot of times we want our turn one to be an elf or a gilded goose, but then sometimes we need that two black mana on turn two. For example, if we play Lana War Elves on one, we can only tap that for green on turn two. So turn two, we would have one green from the elves, one black from whatever land we're playing on turn two. If the only land we dropped on turn one was just green, then we'd have two green and one black. And there isn't any way for us to play a two drop and a one drop unless we get lucky and have another green one drop um, with that mana setup. There's just so many times where if you have something that makes only green, uh, you're going to be in a really difficult position where you can't use that extra mana effectively unless maybe you have one of your three drops to play. So it's really important, especially with Ayara here, where we can't play Ayara on three ever if we have something that just makes green, right? We have to wait until at least turn four. So there's a lot of little ways that add up to a much bigger presence on the curve than you would really think. But it's incredibly crucial that all of our green mana taps for green on turn one and then can tap for black on every turn after that. Very important. The one card that is the exception to that rule is Lair of the Hydra. We have one land in the whole deck that doesn't make black. And that's because this is the land that can turn into a creature for the least amount of mana. So... Sometimes we get into a position where we just need another creature to sacrifice, and if we have a Lair of the Hydra on the field, we can just pay two mana, turn it into a 1-1, one, one, sack it to the Priest, and get our engine going again. And sometimes that's just enough to pull out the win that turn, and it's important to be able to do that. So just the one Lair of the Hydra that can tap for green and get us our Elf or our Goose on turn one can be a creature later in the game. That's the one exception I'm going to make. But everything else here, three Blooming Marsh, three Lana War Wastes, and, th and four Overgrown Tomb can tap for green on one, black on two, and then the four Overgrown Tomb, along with the five Swamps, gives us nine Swamps in the deck, lands that count as Swamps, because the Overgrown Tombs counts as a Swamp and a Forest, so that Castle Lockthwain can come down untapped. Castle Lockthwain is a land that, if you don't have a Swamp, it comes into play tapped, taps for black mana, but later in the game, if we start to run out of gas, it's another way for us to start to refill our hand, pay three mana, tap it, draw a card, but we lose life equal to the number of cards in our hand. And that's fine in this deck because we're gaining a bunch of life here and there off all of the pings. Um, so a lot of times it's fine. We get to a point where we're out of gas and we just need to draw more cards to close out the game. And we have extra life that we don't necessarily need. And we can put it into the castle here, draw cards, and get back to where we need to with our hand size. We've also got two Agadim's Awakening because it's another thing that we can play on curve as a land. We don't mind losing the life if we have to play it untapped. But if we draw this later in the game, we top deck it. Sometimes we can get back a one drop and a priest or fiend artisan 
for five mana. Sometimes if we can manage to scrounge up six mana, we can actually get back a three drop as well, like an Ayara or a Woe Strider or a Midnight Reaper, and that can be incredibly powerful. The last card I want to talk about here is the most recent addition and probably the most underrated and overpowered card in the whole deck, and that's Tyvar Jubilant Brawler. This is one green, one black, and one for a three loyalty planeswalker. You may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. Plus one, untap up to one target creature. Minus two, mill three cards. Then you may return a creature card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. This card does so much in this deck, it's ridiculous. So first of all, if Tyvar's just in play, forget about the loyalty abilities. Our elves can tap for mana the turn they come into play. They basically get played for free because they can tap to generate the mana to replace themselves. Same with the goose. Uh, more importantly, our priest can be used the turn it comes into play immediately to sack things. We don't have to wait. We don't have to hope our opponent doesn't have sorcery speed removal. We just slam the priest and we start going to town. Same thing with Fiend Artisan. We can slam the Fiend Artisan, immediately use it to search up another card like a priest or something. We don't have to wait a whole turn cycle and give our opponent the chance to destroy it with sorcery speed removal. Like, we can just use all of that stuff right away, and that's pretty wild. Even Ayara's ability to sacrifice something to draw a card we could use right away. But then, if you look at the uptick, you can untap up to one target creature. This means not only can we get extra mana out of our elves, right, or extra uses out of our Fiend Artisan, or we can sacrifice something to the Fiend Artisan to search up a creature and then untap it, and it's even bigger than it was before you sacked the creature, and now you can swing in with it, which is can be pretty insane, but also you can untap the Priest and use it twice in the same turn. If you already have a Tyvar down, you could slam a Priest, use it that turn, untap it with Tyvar's plus one, use it again. You can go from no ability to use priest at all to two activations in the blink of an eye and then you have the minus two ability which brings something back from the yard and that thing that you bring back from the yard you can use right away so even if they kill our priest on two we could slam tyvar on turn three minus two to bring it back and immediately use it because of tyvar's static ability it just gets wild also even if your graveyard is nuked, say they exiled your graveyard, or not enough stuff has died yet, or whatever the case may be, this mills three cards when you use it. Which means you can even go from like not having any value to get off this card, from milling and finding something you can get, and putting it into play and getting some value, but you can also mill cards into your yard for use with things like Call of the Death Dweller, or for just making Fiend Artisan that much bigger to swing in. So there's just a lot of synergy baked in, Tyvar just does so much work in this deck. He's absolutely unbelievable, and I love it. Now, that was a mouthful. This is a crazy deck. I'm super proud about it. Let's check out the games. Keep seven. This is the kind of opening hand we want. A mana dork, another one drop, a priest or fiend. In this case, we have both. And two lands. And then the last card can be whatever. We'll start with the goose. <clears throat> well, it's really tempting to play Ayara first here. But I think Priest is too important. So we're going to do that. We top deck a land, we can play Bastion before activating the Priest, and that would be pretty sick. Otherwise, we're going to have to play it afterwards. Well... Do it now. Make him sack his 1 1. 
cutthroat, huh? Well, I think I want the bastion before I want the cutthroat. But do I want Ayara? I think I'll Ayara. Scorpion. And then we might have to play Cutthroat and then use Cutthroat mana to get down Bastion. Mana off of Priest. Okay, plays the Nyssa. And that will what? Tap for three mana now? Play the Love Struck Beast. Seems fine to me. It's really hard to dis decide. We'll do those. Now we can't block. We'll play another priest. Get for two. Mattius. Yeah, Nissa's kind of crazy. This has always been crazy. I remember when standard meta was Nissa and Hydroid Crisis and all that BS. And they'd ramp into like uh what was it? Ugin? this mono green is the meta, then I'm happy. Because our deck will normally beat this. How did Ayara die? No blocks. For some reason I was thinking Love Struck Beast couldn't block or attack unless we had a 1-1, one -one, but it's just attack. I shouldn't have swung in. I haven't played against that card in a while. Lesson learned. Wow, we didn't even need to play our Bastions. Alright, we gotta mull this. We've got no green for the goose. and We don't have either part of our engine. This, we can keep. One, two. I think we toss back the Bastion. Keep the land to make sure that we can play Tyvar and actually have the three mana to use Fiend Artisan's ability to sack the Scorpion uh, so that we can find our Priest. for 
one. Play the Fiend Artisan. He'll probably kill it. If he's holding up two mana and he's he's in black. Right? Fatal push. Grizzly salvage. Okay. He's doing parahelion shenanigans. Did this deck get anything from uh, Shadows? Wayfinder. Chariot. Alright, so we've got a Chariot and a Parahelion in the yard. That's not the best news ever. We've got to get... We've got to get our combo online. Priest. We're going off next turn. Oh shit, I needed to use the elf. That kind of, that kind of sucks. so bad. Let's just try this. I think we'll try this. Can win. Submit one, sack you and you. Kill the Wayfinder, so he has to actually sacrifice a cat. Fiend Artisans. Swinging with the 5-5. Five five. Gonna block with the Chariot. Seems pretty good. Use Fiend Artisan to find something. We can get extra mana out of the Elves by untapping it if we want. Let's do this. Let's go. 
One, two, three. Sack the elf. Find. Do we want Woe Strider? Cutthroat, Reaper. There's so many options. We're going to have four mana and be able to untap something. Let's do the Reaper. Priest, Scorpion, use another Priest, oh my god, Tyvar is a god, Tyvar is a god in this deck, Tyvar is an animal. Oh my god. Tyvar is an animal. Uh, we got our priest, so we'll keep this. We don't have a mana dork, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. Got to start with the tomb so that the castle can come down untapped next turn. I assume he gets rid of the priest. He's got it, right? I mean, he could get rid of the, the Awakening, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We'll play the Cult Conscript. Attacks the Arcanist, we can kill the Arcanist, which is nice. Discard a card, sure. Like he could thought seize us again. But we absolutely kill the Arcanist if he does. So I don't think he will. I mean, he could just swing with it and sack it to village rights. Yeah, this is going to be really tough. Script can come back later. Can't do a whole lot with his graveyard yet. I 
instant or sorcery make a 1 1. Looks likely there's no fourth land drop. Now the question is, do we get the Priest out, or do we just put the Bastion out to capitalize? I guess if we're ever going to get the Priest out, it needs to be now, right? Get in for a couple points of damage. Next turn, we play the Bastion, we sack the Scorpions. We drain them for eight. Yeah, he needs one more card in the yard for the Croxa. One more. And I don't think he'll have the mana to get something in the yard and... And uh, also bring back the Croxa. If we blocked and killed the Pyromancer, he would have been able to bring back the Croxa. Which is why I did not. Part of it. But also we're going to get more value off the Priest. Didn't pay the two life. Interesting. So he must not have a one mana spell in hand. If that's the case. Six. Akanuma. Well, it's definitely going to help. Ooh, another priest. I wanted to bring back the cult conscript, but... I think it's better to play the priest in case he has targeted removal. And then we'll swing. Uh, now if he wipes our board, he dies. What's up, Duchess? Welcome to the stream. Guess what? I ate a bagel with my Christmas tree plate. I'm not hangry today. And that's a very good thing. Maybe I will. Oh my god. We wreck this guy so hard right now. The things I was about to do to you. This does not have any of our engine pieces, so we need to mulligan it. Same. Alright, we keep this. Oh, it's a one lander. I mean, it is what it is. 
We just need to top deck a land or we lose. That's all. Hmm, close enough. Guess we don't lose. It is gonna be tricky though. Oh god, another Elvish Mystic. Another Elvish Mystic. Master. Two Mystics into two War Masters is like God draw for this guy. Let's see if we can still uh, overcome. Gonna put him at seven. And a three three fiend artisan. <sighs> Very close. Tap the elves for mana, sack the elves to the fiend artisan to find another scorpion. Sack the scorpion and the fiend artisan to the priest to kill him. That's the plan. And doesn't look like he has removal, so I think we got it. Go. Earn your renown. Sure we got him. Yeah, there we go. Good night. I don't know if a one lander is gonna do it, but we can play Gilda Goose on one. And then if we get lucky and top deck a land, we can play Tyvar. And if we don't, we can just play Cult Conscript, hold on to the food. We're also on the draw, so we have a better chance of hitting our another our next land. So we're, we're going to keep this. You might play it for the Daily 15 tomorrow. <laughs> Duchess, you're so funny. see what we got here. Simic. Come on, land. Oh no, not this deck. At least the goose can hold it off. But our turn two play is going to be incredibly important. So we really need the land. Um, I typically get my daily 15 without actually trying to get my daily 15, if that makes any sense. I play enough, it just kind of happens. Play the elf. Hold 
hold on to the mana. We're not going to play the conscript. Rattle chains. Maybe we can meet hook for one. Next turn. He would definitely counter that, right? Maybe we don't. Maybe we just play the cutthroat. I mean, we're dealing with counter spells here, so we have to be very careful. Spell queller, sure. Is it worth it to play the Cult Conscript and try and race because he's tapped out? Like, chances are pretty slim we're going to land a 3-drop next turn, right? I think we just go for it. I don't love it, but he's tapped out, and I think it's all we can do. I'll say this, though. If we hadn't missed our land drops... We would be killing it right now. Three mana. If it gets countered, it's better that we play the Woe Strider. If it doesn't get countered... Probably better that we play the Tyvar. Spell Queller's out, so... I think if he can counter whatever we play, we're just done for. So we have to play as if he can't. Okay, he's got another Spell Queller. Six and go to five. He's gotta be running out of gas by now, right? How do we survive? We need to gain a life. Does he have the counter spell? We will find out. Because this is our only real play. He's got it, right? He's got three cards left in his hand. some life. It's not the best ever, but it keeps us alive another turn. Jesus, Shackle Geist too. Oh. Did I say it kept us alive another turn? What I meant to say was that, uh, we concede. I'm actually surprised we stood as much a chance as we did on that one. We dragged it out to, what, turn six? And we were on one land for, like, the first... four turns. <laughs> we'll keep seven.
Bishop of Wings. Speaker of the Heavens. That's fine. Definitely need the priest out. And if he kills the priest, we can tie bar it. Which would be sick. Giada. Ooh, so close. So, so close. Alright, we're gonna play. Zulaport Cutthroat. Sack the Elves and the Scorpion. Get some mana. Decisions. If we tie Var, we could untap the priest, but we don't have a third creature in order to use it. Or if we minus two, we could hit another priest, theoretically. I think it would be better to just do this. I think we save the Tyvar for either if he kills the priest and we need to get it back, or if we need to untap it and use it a second turn and we actually have enough creatures in order to do that with. Sack a creature. Let's make it a fight to remember. Swing here. sacrifice something again. Alright. We could Bastion, or we could Call. If we Call, we get back Reaver, Scorpion, Reaver of Masses, and that's a lot of creatures. But if he ends up wiping the board, eh, he's only at two mana. He can't wipe the board. If he ends up wiping the board, it would be better to get the Bastion. I guess we'll keep this. Alright, we'll start with the cult conscript, try and get in for 
an early two points of damage. Strategic planning. Sure. Swing two. Sack the conscript to grab, grab our priest. Does he have a sweeper? Artisan. Interesting choice. Another fiend artisan, or another priest, rather. We'll wait on the fiend artisan. Strategic planning again. You're at 10. Tyvar, so that we can tap you for a green mana, and then we're going to sack uh, Wo Strider and the Goose. Bring back can win. I mean it's really tempting to bring back the scorpion, right? One, two, three, four. We could put him at one. so much for checking out my channel. We're working hard to get to 2,000 subscribers now because we blew right past 1,000. So make sure you like and subscribe. Also, if you'd like more magic death text, that's somewhere over there. And if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately, that's somewhere over there. Also, subscribe, circle below, do all the things.